Okay, Mia, we're going to let you go ahead and introduce uh, introduce everybody and get this started. Okay, so I can start. Right, hello everyone. My name is Dr. Mia Vieja. I'm a research fellow at the University of Pretoria in South Africa. I'm an ecologist by training and my research focuses on the distribution, habitat use and foraging ecology of marine predators across the Southern Ocean. I'll be your moderator this evening. You can use the chat box to ask me questions and which I will then present to our presenters or our speakers at the end of the presentation. Uh, so feel free to type out your questions, put them there in the chat box and I'll be sure they get asked. So just a bit of background and introduction. Our presenters tonight are Dr. Clive McMahon, who is the scientific and operations uh, manager at the Sydney Institute for Marine Sciences in Australia. He coordinates on behalf of the Integrated Marine Observing System, Australia's ongoing animal-borne ocean observing system in the Southern Ocean. He has 25 years of experience working on elephant and weddell seals. Clive is especially interested in integrating animal biology and ocean physics to quantify changes in the environment and how these translate to animal performance. Our second speaker is Professor Fabian Lucay, who is a physical oceanographer in the Department of Marine Sciences at the University of Gothenburg in Sweden. His interests lie in the observe, observation of study of the global ocean circulation with a specific focus on the Southern Ocean circulation and has used oceanography data collected by SEALs to complement this research for the past 15 years. So welcome to this presentation about Anibos and animal born ocean sensors. So just a bit of background on why we are all here tonight. Marine animals equipped with electronic sensors have produced long-term data streams on key environmental variables, hydrography, animal behavior, and ecology for several years now. To integrate these animal-borne observations into the Global Ocean Observation System, or GOOS, Clive and Fabian led a community proposal for recognition in GOOS that was approved last year in 2020. So they act as co-chairs of the Animal Born Ocean Census Network, or ANIBOS. Um, and tonight they'll give you a bit of background and introduction of why this is necessary for the network. So, but with that, I'll leave it to Clive to start this off and tell us a bit more about ANIBOS. Enjoy. Great. Thanks very much, Mia, for, for that uh, lovely introduction to the work I do and, and to Annie Boss and, and also to Fabian. Um, welcome to, to this introductory talk. I, I hope everybody enjoys it and gets a good background of, of where we're at. The, the talk is really about um, the coming of age and um, I think this is you know sort of one of those opportunities where we're, we're the face of, of a new system or a, a new network but um, really it's been built on the shoulders of, of giants and um, we just hope that uh, tonight we can give you a, a nice background and look forward to the questions at, at the end of the evening. Uh, both Fabian and I will present and I'll switch over to the next slide and let Fabian jump in straight away and um, we'll go from there. Thank you. Thanks, Fabian. Yeah, hey. Uh, thanks, Clive. Hello, everyone. So, yeah, um, you've probably seen these kind of pictures maybe in the media. There's actually a meme around that particular picture uh, of uh, a seal uh, talking to his friend seal uh, with a tag. And um, this project has been, uh, of course, very good for like uh, the media. Uh, everybody loves to see elephant seals with these funny hats. And here we will talk about what, what we can do with uh, these loggers. So please continue. So a bit of background. Um, so this project has really uh, started with a, a big focus on uh, the polar oceans and in particular on the Southern Ocean. And on, on this map, you can see for a particular month, uh, but it's quite typical, the, the distribution of uh, ocean data that we, we get. So on uh, the ocean ops, uh, formerly GCOMOPS website. And as you can see, uh, the, 
polar regions in particular are very poor uh, in data compared uh, to any other uh, region. Uh, and this is easily explainable. This is, uh, these regions are very hard to access, especially in winter. Uh, there's uh, sea ice, there's very harsh climate, it's far from any uh, major city. And so, yeah, the project started pretty much uh, by trying to answer the question, how, how can we fill in those gaps? Please continue. And in the early uh, 2K, so there, there had been already quite a lot of work by uh, biologists in the 90s to, to develop uh, all kinds of loggers that could be attached on animals. But the, the original goal was mainly to understand better animals. But uh, in the early 2K, it became uh, quite obvious that you, we could get both information on the animals and on their uh, physical environment uh, at the same time using those kind of tags. And here you have the example of uh, one seal. Uh, so the the yellow, um, the islands that you can see uh, on the corner, this is, these are the, the Kerguelen Islands and an FN seal uh, got the first uh, trial uh, logger in 2003. And, and then he went south by about a thousand kilometers and he really convinced everyone that we were uh, on a very interesting path here. As you can see uh, toward the end of his uh, journey, just before the, that particular logger stopped emitting, uh, that seal was uh, diving to the bottom to uh, about 1,850 meters uh, maximum, so very deep. And so, that particular logger was recording temperature and uh, pressure, but soon after um, salinity was recorded at the same time. And so we had a very unique and interesting way to uh, gather uh, hydrographic data. So here you can see an example of um, an elephant seal that uh, was um, uh, instrumented in uh, 2008. Uh, from the Caribbean Islands, and that particular seal went down to the Antarctic Shelf, which is 2,000 kilometers south of the Caribbean Islands, and stayed there for a couple of months before returning, staying around Heard Island, and back to the Caribbean Island. And so here you can see that we, we gather a lot of data, both temperature and salinity. These are the colored plots that you can see uh, on the right. And, and you could track the properties of the different water masses uh, that the animal was uh, encountering during his trip. Please. So to get those data, we were using, uh, and we're still using uh, massively uh, um, a particular type of uh, logger, which is called a CTD SRDL, which has been developed at the Simama Research Unit in Scotland. Uh, and that uh, tag uh, can record temperature, conductivity, pressure, um, and then um, take that data, uh, store it, compress it, and send it through uh, the Argos uh, system so that we can get uh, profiles of both temperature and salinity in uh, practically real time. Uh, within uh, 24 to 48 hours uh, after being recorded. And that technology uh, so has been uh, since uh, developed further uh, and uh, used on many different animals, so many elephants, but not just them. Also, we will see that there's a wide range of uh, species that have been used to get those uh, kind of uh, data. So the idea is simple. You put the tax on the animal uh, on land most often. Uh, then the animal is diving and usually it's when the animal is coming back to surface that uh, the CTD data is being recorded. And then it's been transmitted through Argos back to CLS Argos. Uh, so and we can then uh, redistribute it around. So in between, there are some uh, technical steps that need to be achieved. Uh, so decoding, archiving, post-processing, 
uh, and make sure, of course, that we get the best uh, possible accuracy. So uh, right now, with this particular kind of tags, we can get a precision of around 0 0.03 degrees Celsius in temperature and 0 0.03 gram per kilogram in uh, salinity, which is uh, not as good, of course, uh, as an Argo float um, or uh, even better uh, a CTD on, on a ship. But this is definitely enough accuracy to do some proper uh, science. And so here we are. So 15 years later, we have now data uh, in many regions of the world ocean, uh, in particular in the Southern Ocean, uh, in the North Atlantic, and in the North Pacific. Uh, this data comes from different groups in different countries, making this project uh, international. Uh, we have around 12 uh, nations, so here they are not listed all of them because there's some new actors too. But um, so we have a dozen nations involved. And uh, on the graph to the uh, left, what you can see is the number of profiles per unit degree latitude that we get for different uh, observing systems. So in blue, it's MIOP. These are the animal-borne ocean uh, sensors data. Uh, in orange, it, this is Argo. And in red, it's uh, the CTD, uh, ship-based CTDs. And this plot uh, shows that uh, already now, um, MIOP data are uh, giving the largest number of profile uh, south of 60 south and a, a very substantial amount, uh, especially in subpolar regions. Yes, please. Okay, so now here you have an animation. Uh, so it, it's a, a pseudo year. It's not an actual year, but it's uh, it's if we were deploying uh, we had deployed all the tags uh, within a single year, while in reality it's been deployed uh, throughout about 15 years. And so the colors give you the sea surface temperature obtained uh, by these um, loggers, by satellite transmission. And you can see the position. Uh, so as you can see, the, the distribution in the Southern Ocean is not uh, homogeneous, especially uh, and it is also not homogeneous temporally. It depends on um, the biology, the ecology of elephant seals. There are particular period of the year where they uh, comes back to land, either for molting or for um, um, reproduction. But uh, in fact, we get most of our data in winter, and that's really key. Uh, we get the data in winter, many of them in sea ice covers regions. So it basically in region and uh, seasons that are um, completely uh, free of any other data. So that shows very uh, clearly the potential for complement uh, our observing system using this kind of approach. Yes, Clive. OK, so the data has been available publicly for now uh, some years. There's a data portal uh, called MIOP. And overall, we are really happy about what has happened through MIOP. So it's been uh, very successful. There's been more than 100 publications uh, directly based on this data set. Um, but at the same time, we have reached uh, uh, several limits uh, within MIOP. So that uh, pushed us to go uh, further, to go somewhere else, uh, to go uh, bigger. Uh, so the limits are manpower. So there's not enough people uh, to manage all, all the data flow that is coming and that is increasing every year. We also have a problem of governance because there's more and more actors, so we need to have a very clear structure. Uh, and, and then technical expertise as the number of uh, different kind of loggers and the number of different kind of species 
increased, we need a wider and wider expertise. So MIOP has been a very important step in uh, developing this approach, but now uh, we felt that we needed uh, something uh, more. And so this was discussed uh, thoroughly uh, during a workshop uh, in Hobart in November 2019. Here you, you can see a group picture of all the people that were present at, at this very, um, very important uh, workshop that has been a turning point for our uh, community. And that led to uh, what we are now uh, presenting, which is Anibos. You can change the slide. Yeah, and so, yeah, we're very proud uh, to introduce, introduce you to, to Anibos uh, today. Uh, so, formerly Anibos um, has been endorsed in uh, May 2020, so it's more than a year ago. And there's been a kickoff meeting uh, in November 2020, followed by a formation of um, the different groups uh, that uh, Clive is going to describe. Um, and so, yeah, it's about one year of work now, and, and now we, we feel ready to uh, launch it publicly and start uh, the real thing uh, around Anibos. So, Clive, I think you can continue from there. Excellent. Thanks, Fabian. That's a, a really nice lead up to, um, to where we are today, and, and I think really shows quite clearly that um, the, the work we're presenting here today is is actually the culmination of um, many decades of work by many hundreds of people, um, and uh, you know just acknowledging that making that happen in an environment that's common to us all in in terms of research is is no mean feat because um, it's all based on funding and long term funding is is hard to get so so this is um, a real credit to to many, many people, um, some of whom no doubt are, are listening in. So Annie Boss was um, essentially born in, um, in May, June 2020. Um, and when we were officially endorsed by, by Goose through the, the OCG, um, so the Observation Coordination Group. And our main, um, or, or our, our future really is captured in our vision and our, our mission here. Now, vision, I'll just read this out, is to enhance the understanding and describe our changing oceans through the eyes of marine mammals. And I think this captures some of the things Fabian was talking about. We're talking about physics and we're talking about biology and we're, we're trying to integrate that here in Anibos and we're, we're trying to be collaborative. And our mission to, to enhance this collaboration is to collect and make these data freely available um, especially from the most inaccessible parts of the ocean. And animals offer us a really unique um, component into observing the oceans because they do go to places that are hard to get to with ships and, and with uh, traditional methods like floats. And so I think for us, this is, is a real boost and, and um, the key thing that, that sets us apart from some of the other systems, despite some of the, the technical issues. So the, the, um, the potential for animal-borne systems is really summarised, I think, in, in this figure here, where we can use a whole lot of different animals, species ranging from, from mammals through to birds, reptiles, um, fish and sharks. And, and I guess um, as we do that, we're, we're not only observing the ocean, but we're also able to observe the interface right at the surface between the ocean and the atmosphere. And we can do this to quite great depths in the ocean too. So elephant seals, for example, um, some of the whale, the, the cetacean, the toothed uh, cetaceans will dive really deeply, um, up to 2,000 metres and, and probably even beyond. We haven't really tested the limits of, of how deeply we're able to sample using animals. But suffice to say, for now, it's really probably most commonly in the upper 1,000 metres of the ocean. And of course, as everybody knows, this is a critical part of the ocean in terms of climate change. And, and probably everybody is aware of the, the IPCC report that came out earlier this week. Um, the oceans are, are a key part of, of understanding our global climate. I think we jumped ahead there. It's smarter than I think. The objectives of ANIBOS is, again, 
Anibus is, is unique and we deliver across a number of the GOOSE objectives. Essentially, we collect, our aims are to collect and disseminate high quality information, um, physics, biogeochemical and uh, biological. We do this in situ at a scale and resolution that's relevant to the animals, but it's also re relevant to the physics community. And we're doing, integrating these two bits of information, we provide a foundation for understanding how animals respond to changes in the ocean, and we're able to also track how the ocean is changing itself. Oops. Slight technical hitch there. I think this one actually should be there. There we go, it duplicated in, in somewhere. So how do we do this? You've seen a little bit of this figure, and Fabian touched on this um, a, a little bit in, in some of the earlier talks. What we really try to do, um, we as in the animal community over the many decades that I mentioned is to take this um, instrument over here. I hope you can see the little cursor. So that's the ship rosette, the CTD coming off the ship and miniaturize that to something that we can actually put on animals so that we can access these difficult um, parts of the ocean to reach. We've done that quite successfully through the, the Sea Mammal Research Unit in Scotland, as, as Fabian de described. And more recently, um, there's been a, a new instrument come on board um, out of uh, wildlife computers in, in the US. And both of these instruments are now being used in the field to collect um, oceanographic and, and, well, physical and, and biological data. And I'll just go run through this slide a little bit. It, it's, gives a little bit more detail as to the, the slide that Fabian showed earlier on. Um, essentially, it's the same thing. Over here in, in the left top part of the, um, the, the schematic is really the, the pre-deployment components that go on. So before the instruments head out um, into the field to be attached to animals, they go through um, a calibration process, both um, at the manufacturer level and then also pre-deployment um, where, where instruments uh, are calibrated in a, a laboratory setting, in a, a water bath. Um, the instruments then attached to the animal either um, in the tropics, the sub-Antarctic or the Antarctic, so it's a, a global project and those three, the, the three panels on, on the left there just give us um, a little bit of a, a flavour of the, the sort of latitudinal range, so right from the tropics to to the high polar regions um, with a turtle in the tropics and, and a Weddell seal down um, in the Antarctic and of course our favourite animal in the middle there, the elephant seal. Um, so the instruments are attacked, uh, attached to the, the animals at their breeding sites. The animals then head off to sea, um, sometimes for, for many months at a, at a time, and collect temperature, um, salinity information, uh, also information on behaviour, and then each time the animal surfaces, as Fabian mentioned, um, the, the instrument communicates with the satellite, the Argos uh, constellation, um, back through Toulouse in France, and then is distributed from there post some um, decoding, decompression, etc. So that's essentially how the work is done. What are we doing? And, and this I, I hope captures a little bit better, um, Fabian alluded to, to this slide um, earlier on, the, the different animals um, that, that we're, we're using, the marine animals, so birds, mammals, um, penguins, turtles, sharks, fish, and the, the data that we're collecting is, is from a, a whole range, so we're collecting some of the essential ocean variables. In our case, particularly conductivity, temperature, there's some work on dissolved oxygen and more recently some work on, on chlorophyll using um, fluorometry. This cuts across a, a range of users. So there's researchers, there's the operational component, there are the data sensors, the networks, and of course they're, they're local stakeholders using the, the data. And I hope um, this gives you a little bit of a flavour again from the, the latitudinal range. So it's a global project um, across a number of things and there, there are a number of complexities that come with using these different animals, potentially the slightly different kinds of data that come through. And that really um, 
I think illustrates the the need for Anibos to um, to come of age as a coordinated um, bona fide group that has a, a structure to to drive the the future of collecting and collating and ultimately making these data available to the community. It's well beyond the capacity of, of a single group of people um, and it needs coordination across a, a much broader, um, a broader range of, of, of people and, and administrative capacity. Um, and hence, um, we have in Anibos uh, a steering committee um, and supporting the steering committee, we have a, um, an animal welfare and a data committee. And I'll talk a little bit more about those as we we get through. I'll pass over to um, to Fabian again for a little while. Yeah. So just briefly, we've talked a lot about physics so far, but uh, the very important aspect around uh, animal-born sensors is, is that you can you can get um, more than just physics, and in particular. You, you get behavioral data that you can relate directly to um, the physical environment and, and therefore know um, better what determine the foraging strategy, what uh, drive uh, the behavior of these animals when, when they are at sea. And so there are a wide range of tags uh, that, are, um, um, that, that exist and that are used uh, some of them are really focused entirely on the behavior, so dive profilers with just pressure data, maybe uh, low quality temperature, um, but you have also some tags with, that will uh, measure accelerometry so that you can get information about prey catch events or fat condition. Uh, you can have detailed tracks uh, if you use GPS. Um, and then, yes, the, the studies uh, are essentially driven by biological questions. So it is very important for us that it is always a biologist that uh, lead uh, that work uh, for obvious ethical reasons. We don't uh, want to put tags uh, simply to get more observation, but it's more than a win-win situation where we get um, information for biologists, uh, and as a byproduct, we get very valuable uh, ocean data. And so, this biological question can be uh, quite uh, uh, varied. So, habitat preference, competition, or the impact of renewable energies and uh, conservation are all uh, themes that can be tackled uh, using. Uh, ocean loggers, um, animal uh, loggers. And so you can see, uh, so here I list uh, some of the main manufacturers that um, are in the market, so wildlife computers, uh, SeerTrack and SMRU, there, there are more, uh, and some of them will probably become uh, more and more important in the future. This is unpredictable. So we really want to welcome all the uh, possible data coming from any sort of tags, uh, if this data can be uh, useful for ocean studies. And so you can see uh, the design of different uh, tags here. The first is the CTDSRDL that I talked about, but then the other are different type of loggers that will produce um, more some more behavioral data, some physics, some uh, being uh, mixed. All right, Clive. Oh, I'm not sure what happened there. Something bizarre. Sorry, everybody. There we go. Oh yeah. So, so here you can see um, an example of uh, another uh, use that is growing uh, very uh, quick uh, in the community. Uh, which is to use uh, turtles uh, to deploy loggers uh, and uh, sea turtles, so depending on the species, can go more or less far from uh, their uh, breeding site. Uh, some are actually traveling several thousands of kilometers for months. The leatherback turtle in particular have very imp impressive abilities to dive deep and uh, travel uh, far. And so, 
Yeah, so this is the turtles are uh, expected to become uh, large contributors uh, in Anibos, especially in uh, tropical and subtropical regions. And another example, so the next slide is um, a shark. Uh, so this is work done in uh, IT. Um, and so you can see on the fin of the shark, there is a small tag. Uh, which can uh, transmit data through a, a radar system and that measure pressure and temperature during several months. So this is another type of um, application for the animal-borne ocean sensors. Excellent, thanks Fabian. Um, yes, so again, just to reiterate, um, what we've got here is just an illustration of how the, um, the animal born sensors are actually filling some of the, the gaps, the observational gaps we've had. So uh, Fabian showed the, the really nice figure earlier on from, from Ocean Obs. Um, here, just to, to reiterate that um, in the, the first little panel A, we have um, where the Argo floats are. So Argo is probably, uh, or not probably, Argo is the most comprehensive ocean observing system or network we have at the moment. Um, but there are some limitations and you'll see some of the white spots. Um, you see some of the white spots. This is where we don't um, get information from, from the Argo for various reasons. It's, it's difficult for Argo to get into the high polar latitudes. It's hard for, polar, uh, for, for Argo to, to measure information in, in shallow uh, tropical seas. Um, in panel B, we can see where we're getting information from, from animals, primarily um, seals in, in this figure, also some cetaceans in, in the north, and they fill nicely some of those gaps that, um, that we have in panel A. And what we've got in panel C is just um, a, a distribution of, of a whole lot of tracking studies from animals. So those are not um, oceanographic data, but just uh, behavioural data showing the potential for, for animals to fill in all of those white spots that we have um, in the panel above it in, in A. And then panel D is, is again, just to, to reiterate how the, the system from its very beginnings in, in the 80s and, and 90s has grown rapidly. Um, and now in, in terms of the um, CTDs, uh, especially so the, the oceanographic data, um, animal telemetry is, is playing a, a huge and, and growing role and again reiterates that the need for a coordinated network approach. So our priorities, as I mentioned earlier on, centre around two, two essential components of the project. One is animal welfare. Um, we can't, uh, as Fabian mentioned, just go out and, and stick all sorts of things to animals and hope that uh, there'll be a social licence for that from the community. We actually need to be thoughtful about this and um, this comes on the back of a whole lot of development to, to ensure that instruments are small and to ensure that the instruments don't affect the, the animals that, um, that we're attaching them to. Because ultimately, as, as Fabian mentioned, a lot of this was born out of the desire to understand um, animal behaviour and, and ecology. And the last thing we, were, we wanted to do was to actually affect the data, that, the very data that we're collecting so the oceanographic, the physical data has come as a little bit of a byproduct of, um, of the biology. And uh, again, as Fabian mentioned, the, the biology remains a, a central component and, and a, differ, a, a point of differentiation from, um, from the other networks for us where we're still focusing very heavily on, on animal behaviour. And so to ensure that, um, that we keep that we follow best practice um, and that we, we keep up to date with uh, progress in um, the welfare and uh, an ethics environment. We've, we've set up a, an animal welfare committee within ANIBOS. And the main, um, uh, uh, the, the main responsibilities of the, the welfare committee are to ensure that animal, the use of animals is justified so that um, not only do we get the physical environment that the animals and, and conservation are, are, are benefiting from what we're doing. And um, essentially we're following very closely the three R's, so replacement, reduction and refinement principles there. The committee also ensures that the network activities comply with 
best practice and uh, we're in the process of producing a best practice document that we're, we're hoping to submit in the next few months that'll summarize all of our handling practices um, and is a community-led program where we've taken the best from everybody and uh, and hope that um, that that'll be the standard uh, method uh, and, and practice used in the field for attaching instruments um, but also capturing and, and handling instruments because um, hopefully you've got a little bit of a flavor from from some of the slides some of the animals um, are, are large so so elephant seals um, are many hundreds of, of kilograms um, and they require specific ways to to handle and capture them um, some of that involves anesthetics um, so you do need a whole lot of expertise around that to to ensure the, the welfare of the animals the committee also welcomes ongoing feedback because things change over time um, better techniques are available better anesthetics for example are also available so it's um, it's maintaining a fresh uh, approach and and also a flexible approach to, to always be um, following the best practice. And then of course, uh, we're hoping, or not hoping, but the, the committee will also collate and, and provide feedback on best practice as new things and new techniques develop. The next is, um, is data, and I'll let Fabian talk a little bit about that. Yes, so I, I don't want to be too long. Um... But uh, really, it's one of the main objectives, of course, of Anibos to uh, streamline all the data flow uh, in a very organized way uh, from, the, from the, the manufacturer to the tag itself to uh, the end user. And so we have started to build uh, an infrastructure um, we were several, uh, so trying to um, copy uh, Argo, or, or, of course, in a smaller and more specialized way. So, where different data centers, so DAC, uh, will take care of uh, different, uh, of gathering the, the data from the different uh, national groups. Um, and so, produce a level one product that will be real time. Uh, and then the data will be exchanged uh, um, with uh, PIs and experts and gathered in a single um, data set that uh, will be delayed mode, so with better quality. Uh, so that would go to a, a GDAC, so a global data center, which will probably uh, be a sort of a virtual structure that will not be a, a, a place, a physical place where there's a global uh, data center, but we mean to have a central uh, data repository, uh, which is the reference for all uh, animal born ocean sensor uh, data. And then uh, these different uh, level of data quality are then uh, transmitted to operational centers and uh, national facilities database uh, at different uh, time frequencies. So we've uh, started to build that again, and, and we are following in particular um, key principles, so the FAIR um, uh, standard, which is findable, accessible, interoperable, reusable, and of course, open. Uh, so we want to make this data open to uh, the public uh, as quick as possible. Of course, with some consideration uh, to the ethics of animals that might uh, then uh, require some, um, some delay before the data is made public. But essentially, and as much as possible to make the data public uh, within a very short time uh, period. So this effort will be led by the data committee, uh, which is already formed. And then the steering committee of Anibos uh, will supervise uh, this work. And um, yes, we hope that through standardized data formats and uh, building up this uh, infrastructure, 
we can um, make the data flow very smooth, uh, producing the best possible uh, quality data uh, in the shortest uh, possible time. Yes, Clive? Excellent. So that brings us essentially to, to the end. And I'd just like to, to summarize briefly, um, I guess, where we're going and, and what we see the, the future um, of, of Anibos now that, um, that we are a, a bona fide uh, network. Um, we have a structure to support the program and um, we're looking to, to a, a, an exciting future of, of an integrated or, or being part of an integrated observing system, um, which is exactly what, what Goose would like, is that, that each of the, the networks contribute um, and that provides a, a truly international and, and integrated system. So we feel that Anibos um, will play an important part and as I mentioned, delivers across um, three of the essential Goose themes, ocean health, climate, and near time real service or real time services. Um, so that's providing data for an, an operational program. We provide data on physics, biogeochemistry, and we do this in undersampled regions. We also, of course, provide biological data and will support other programs like um, the Mega Move initiative, um, the, the, the initiatives from the Biologging Society, and, and a number of others. Um, to, to support those um, in terms of animal behaviour and, uh, and animal tracking and, and conservation data. Anibos finally enhances our ability to observe the ocean structure and the animals that live in them, and this improves our understanding of the oceans, climate processes, and we do this for societal benefit consistent with um, you, the UN Sustainability Goals 13 and 14, primarily climate and life be, below the, the water. So finally, we'd like, we look forward to, to working within the Goose framework and to being a contributing network and, and hope that all of you have enjoyed the, the talk tonight and, um, and that we have, that you have given you some flavour of, of where we're going and, and what we're hoping to achieve in the future. Thanks very much from me. Thanks very much. I'll um, stop sharing my screen. So we are happy to take questions. Mia, I think you need to put your microphone on. Okay, Mia, we can't hear you. Um, I don't know. Uh, she she says she's muted by the organizer. While we try to resolve that, I actually had a, a <laughs> question. Um, I don't see any questions yet, Forrest. If you could unmute. I, I'm jumping in and I'm looking. I'm I'm unmuting, but I don't. Uh... Okay, well, I'll ask my question so long. So I was wondering, um, what's whether there are issues with animals going into different EEZs. How do you deal with that? If you... um, I might uh, jump in there, um, Juliet. That's a, a really good question. Um, as you know, this is is not uncommon across the networks. Um, so floats do drift into um, different nationalities, um, economic zones. Um, there are potential, or there is potential for for conflict um, around that, um, especially in terms of um, national security. And I think um, really Anibos is, is ascribing or prescribing to, to the notion that um, ocean observations in general, most nations feel that, that these are available um, and will facilitate and allow observations 
um, of, of autonomous systems, including animals in, in their national waters and economic zones. Um, but there is certainly some development um, around that through, through the Goose OCG. Um, and I know that, uh, of course, Argo has a, has a special arrangement uh, through Jacob, uh, through Ocean Ops, not Jacob Ops, um, where when instruments do enter um, waters uh, or economic zones, there, there's an alert sent out, and that really just describes that that the instrument is for for scientific purposes, uh, not for nefarious purposes. Um, but the other observing networks um, have have the generic. Um, uh, Sort of, uh, they they follow the generic principle of of data being um, collected for the global community, and under that framework, under that legal framework, um, animals and and other uh, other autonomous systems like floats can move freely um, between zones. Hopefully, that answers your question. Right. Thank you, Clive. Yes, Mia, we can hear you. Sorry, I seem to have a bit of an internet delay on my side. I apologize. Thank you guys for that presentation. Um, that was very really interesting. Um, so people go, I'll open it up. People need to start asking some questions in the chat box. We don't need to. <laughs> You're welcome to. Uh, but while people ask their questions, I've got one for you. Um, can you tell us, so Clive, we spoke a bit about the best practices with animal ethics and so on, but let's say someone is listening in now and they want to start their own program, what could be beyond just the ethical best practices? Is there a document or somewhere people can refer to, to sort of look into what type of instruments to use, what are the best uh, EOVs to use or to measure? Um, yeah, what would be the first step if you're new to this field? Yeah, thanks, Mia. Um, again, that's that's a really good question, and um, and one that um, that we've taken really seriously. So, in the um, in the introductory Annie Boss paper that's currently in review, uh, we've we've done exactly that. Um, we've outlined what we know about best practices for now, and we've listed a whole lot of um, papers and practices that are are available to the broader community um, to to use. Um, but to, to complement that, we're actually also both from the, the data committee and also the, the animal welfare committee is we've instituted or we're, we're in, the, in the process of preparing two documents, one um, on the best practices in terms of data and, and instrumentation and the other in terms of um, animal welfare capture handling. Um, and in the interim, if, if people are listening in and, and do have questions and queries, the, the best thing is, is just to contact either myself or, or Fabian directly and, and we'll point you in the right direction of all of the documentation that has been published, um, but will be synthesized and, and reviewed in the, the upcoming documents. Great. Yes, I, uh, I want you. to. Um, I want to add. Sorry, sorry Mia. Just uh, let's see. So, quick addition uh, that uh, so we are building. We are currently building the the website anibos.com. So it's already live, uh, but of course it's uh, right now very incomplete. But hopefully uh, within the, the coming year. Uh, there will be a lot more information available there, and in, particu uh, in particular uh, on the best practices. We we hope to compile the best information, uh, all the important documents, uh, and show links for each different um, animal species and a particular uh, case. So, on both best practice for animal um, handling. And also best practice on uh, data handling. There should be a lot of information available directly on anibos.com as soon as possible. Thank, thank you, Fabian. Um, 
I have a next question here. What are the approximate costs of tags and do they get more expensive with the number of sensors or parameters measured? Uh, so, yes, so obviously, yeah, I can try. I mean, the, the cost, of course, vary a lot depending on, on the, the type of tags. Uh, uh by a factor 10 uh, uh roughly i mean if you want to do proportion graphy then uh it, it's about um five thousand uh dollar for the base price uh but then you can go of course uh, above if you want more sensors so it all depends on uh the goal that is uh, pursued. And then also one imp important thing to uh, keep in mind is depending on the, the site of deployment, tax can be recovered or not, uh, which of course change a lot the total price. Uh, so on some sites, it has been possible to recover very systematically tax and reuse them for several years while on other sites uh, there's no uh, practical possibility to recover tax then uh, they can be used only once obviously Clive, do you have anything to add to that uh, I, I might just add uh, very briefly that yes the, the the cost of the the instruments of course vary greatly depending on on what you want to do and and the sensors involved in that and um the key thing, though, I think from, from this program is that it is, in fact, um, a relatively cheap instrument compared to, to various other things. Um, so, you know, Argo floats are, are expensive, gliders, ships, they're all expensive and, and they have a particular niche. And, and what we're, tr we're not trying to do, and I, I'm going to reiterate that, we're not trying to replace any of those, but we're, we're trying to complement them. And the instrumentation we use is, is purpose-built and, and I think fits uh, within uh, a cost range that's acceptable for providing the, the kind of data we need, both on the biology and the, the oceanography. So there's a little bit of a trade-off in that. Um, that obviously, uh, you know, Fabian did mention earlier and you would have seen, you know, about accuracy and precision. We don't get the same accuracy and precision we get from a ship's rosette, but what we do get allows us to to study the animals, provide the data we need on their ecology and biology, and also integrate that with, with real physical data from the ocean. Right, thank you. And then perhaps a follow-up question from that is, are there any funding streams that you can recommend? For example, grab from philanthropists or any large European projects? Uh, I'll, I'll start with that. Um, this is the... Um, literally the million dollar question um, <laughs> most of the the Annie boss uh, and, and Miop and and Seuss, uh, Cios, um programs in the past have, have really been supported by national research grants and and largely still are supported by national research grants and we're hoping that um, as a coordinated network um, we can can attract further funding from groups like philanthropists, um, funding from the EU, uh, funding in, in Australia and, and the US. And we're hoping that um, that our bid to for endorsement as part of the UN Decade of the Ocean will help facilitate that. Um, so the short answer from my perspective is, yes, there are a number of opportunities and, and we're hoping to, to pursue those, um, but we don't actually have a specific group that um, that we can recommend going to. Um, so if anyone is out there and does want to throw lots of money at Anibos, we'll happily receive that. But um, please do contact us and, and we're happy to work with people on um, developing proposals, et cetera, to, to help facilitate this. Thank you. Um, our next question is, in terms of the data, are CTD data acquired by the sensors comparable to Argo floats? So yeah, I, I can answer that. So it's definitely uh, comparable in the sense that um, 
we are not in a different world. So the, 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 the accuracy is uh, lower uh, in particular because there are uh, some source of biases that are still not uh, completely controlled. So the precision uh, of uh, sensors, meaning the repeatability, uh, uh, um, uh, is actually quite comparable to Argo. Um, but then the accuracy, so the, the actual uh, closeness to the true value that we're trying to measure uh, is, uh, is limited, is lower uh, uh, compared to Argo by a factor three or so in terms of uh, numbers of accuracy. Um, we are working on that. Uh, there are a number of uh, bottlenecks to improve uh, the, the overall accuracy. Uh, so some of them have, have to do with uh, the need for question when we transmit data. Now, uh, more and more, we are able to recover data. So for those tags, we, we do take get a, a much higher uh, a resolution and therefore we, we can have much better accuracy and better method also to correct uh, some uh, lag effects. Um, yes, and so then there are different uh, issues depending on the sensors. Uh, obviously, it's a very small uh, package uh, compared to uh, an Arco float. And uh, this means uh, some level of degradation in data quality. Uh, but yeah, we have made uh, quite a, a lot of progress on that in the last uh, 10 to 15 years. And it is absolutely uh, within reach to, to get to um, like a level of accuracy that would compare very closely to uh, Argo. So th this is work in progress. Thank you. Uh, Clive, do you want to add anything? No, no, I think um, that was a great summary. Thanks, Fabian. Um, so I have a question. Uh, so you spoke about the biogeochemical sampling and, and things that the sensors collect. Do you think that there will ever be a scope to perhaps incorporate into Anibos um, chemical samples that we collect from the animal's body tissues. So we know where they are swimming, but we're also measuring other things like isotopes and, and um, mercury and things like that. Do you think Anibos could have a scope for data like that? Um, I can I can answer that, um, and, and Fabian might like to, to contribute. The answer is absolutely yes, um, that those kind of data uh, will be available and I, I know that um, there's an instrument being developed um, in Scotland at the moment that, that is collecting some physiological data and will actually transmit those data um, in real time. Um, it's under, under development and, and sort of in the primary phase and I think as our ability and as technology develops um, we're probably going to see more and more of that. Um, I'll also add here that um, you know one of the one of the things that um, that has developed within the, the animal born system is that we can actually use a lot of the physical data we already get to do things like physiology. So dive angles and, and buoyancy in seals can be measured um, to, to quantify con condition and, and changes in condition while the animal's at sea. Um, so you don't always necessarily need um, a, a new instrument to to do things, we, we can actually be and have been very creative in how we're using some of the existing data to measure some of these um, physiological um, parameters that, that you're talking about. And of course, the, the other thing, um, you know, when you, when you talk about um, animal condition um, and, and animal performance at sea, we can do things like collect whiskers to, to do isotope analysis um, and, and integrate that with the actual tracking data and, and we can do that more or less in inverted commas in real time um, from the different signatures and, and how um, the, the chemistry is laid down in, in things like um, uh, whiskers from animals that are, are really not that invasive to collect. Maybe Fabian has um, an addition to that. No, I think this was great, and so thanks.
Great. Uh, well, thank you very much, guys. I've really enjoyed it. Um, but of course, I'm biased. I'm sure our <laughs> listeners have enjoyed it. So just to say that uh, after this talk, the OCG group will send around a questionnaire to understand how people have found this presentation. And if you have some follow-up questions to our speakers, uh, you can use this questionnaire to listen to it. And then a link will be sent around with this presentation for those who haven't been able to join us tonight. So I will end it off here. Um, thank you very much, guys. Do you have anything last or final to add? or? Uh, shall we call it an evening? Uh, I'd just like to say thanks very much, Mia, for, for moderating. Thanks very much, um, OCG Goose, for, for hosting the, the talk and giving us the opportunity to, to present the network to the broader community. And um, of course, I think, um, you know, we can't have a talk like this with, without thanking the, the countless people that, that do the work and, of course, the, the animals that are, are collecting this data for us and, and providing a whole new window on on climate, um, biology, and and physics in the ocean. So thank you very much. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Have a good evening. Great. Thank you. Bye.